Uh, so, dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, welcome to the first edition of the European Left Atrial Appendage Closure Club. Uh, on behalf of this group that you know well, very renowned experts in the field, I would like to warmly uh, welcome you here in Barcelona and explain what is the club, what is the spirit of the club. Uh, one year ago, we were in this meeting room in Paris and we had a double statement. We said, okay, we have still unmet needs, despite literature, 20 years literature, but we also have gaps in knowledge. And uh, we do want to do something different, something that is oriented to the patient's point of view and try to overcome these limitations that we had. So this meeting is not like another LAA meeting. It's yours. It's your meeting. This is the main reason why it's not a meeting. We don't expect you to attend some presentation, to listen, understand or not. We want you to involve, to engage the discussion uh, to give your input, to say if you agree, if you don't, to debate. This is what we have to do if we want to improve. It's a new physician-led initiative aiming to encourage research and share experience with left atrial appendage closure. It's also a working group with selected, dedicated specialists, you. And we have the aim of collecting data for lack and forming a European left atrial appendage closure research registry. There will be a whole session on that. We also want to make research collaborations and initiate multi-center research projects. We also want to have yearly consensus statements, which is very important. We don't have to define the will. We just have to think about colleagues, if they want to refer to a consensus on some topics of the procedure, they can refer, they can have discussion with us. We also want to have a forum for dialogue with the industry, very important. As a group, we think that we can discuss about interest in a trial, interest in a field, what we are missing, what we want them to do to help us. And finally, we want to promote the therapy. We are all passionate. We do this procedure. And we want the procedure to be successful. It's time, because of the pivotal trials that are coming, to do the procedure safely, in a good manner, in our cat labs in Europe. So what about unmet needs and gaps in knowledge? I'm sure you will agree with that. There are many different uh, ways to plan the procedure. We don't know which strategy is the best, CT, TEE, etc. Do we perform this procedure the same way? I'm sure not. But we don't know who is doing what and what is the best way to do the procedure. We don't know which is the best device for which anatomy. Could be sometime interesting to know because some anatomies are very complex, as we will see. Of course, we don't know what is the best antithrombotic option, what is the best timing and tool for follow-up imaging, and when and how we should treat PDL or DRT. We have many, many gaps in knowledge. Of course, we will not be able to solve all of this in one year, but we want, as physicians, to present what we think is important for our patients. One important part of the meeting will be and you will have this discussion today with us, 
to redefine the LAA classification. <laughs> we think that we need a classification that is useful for implanters. Of course, we have this botanical description of appendage, cactus, cauliflower, etc., which is interesting, but we want interventionists and majors have to speak, speak the same language, and we need a classification that addresses our concerns. The consensus statement is one of the goals of the meeting. We want to elaborate consensus with you all together, and you will see, especially for sessions of tomorrow, the end of the session is always the same. Consensus, research proposal, and vote. So you can see that you have never seen that in any meeting. This is how we can make progress. We will show you where we are. If we want to go beyond, we need your input. And uh, we, okay, we engage that the annual consensus statement will be submitted yearly for publication. What about the registry, ELAC research registry? You know that Option, Catalyst, Champion AF are pivotal trials. They will be published in 2025, 2026, maybe 2027. That will be opportunities for a great focus on the procedure. And then, what beyond trials? We do think that it will be a fruitful period for high quality manuscript acceptance in journals. People will need data from real life practice, subgroup analysis, safety. And this is the reason why we want to start and create a registry to think about appropriate items and fill uh, this unmet need. Of course, we would be able to design randomized clinical trials, but also prospective, retrospective registries, multi-centers, surveys, etc. We will show you that. Today, where the knowledge come from? Of course, a randomized clinical trial from the industry, and there should be a knowledge for that. A lot of high value uh, data, high uh, quality randomized clinical trial that you, of course, know. We also have data from the real life with registries initiated by the industry. You know them, and you know a lot of these uh, are guiding our procedure today. We also have some investigator initiated collaborations like. Uh, randomized trial, Swiss Apero and Prague, but also large multi-center registries. And sometimes we have single center large database registries. There are some limitations because most of the published data do not meet all requirements from physicians and patients' point of view. We still haven't met needs. And investiga investigator-initiated trials are often single-shot collaborations with a lack of upfront discussions. We are missing uniform data collection. We are missing data, so this is why it's important to talk together to find uh, the good items that we want to have in the database. If you look at this, the difference between published articles in the field of FLAC versus TAVI the difference is 10 times. Of course, there are many, many reasons to explain that, and the most important being evidence. Because today, in Europe especially, we are 2B. It was 2B in the US now, as you know. Recently, it's 2A. But of course, it's a major point to explain the difference. But there are other differences. There are other reasons to explain that. Look at this trial. I'm sure you know. It's an investigator-initiated trial, the popular TAVI. They have done two ma major manuscripts accepted in New England Journal of Medicine with 600 patients. If we would do the same trial in the field of, ta of LAC, I'm not sure. I'm sure we will not have the same results. So we have to think about that, why and how we can contribute and how we can fill, fill the gap. Another source of inspiration is this, of the club, is this uh, collaborative uh, network in Japan. You probably know them, the Ocean Tavi. They are a group of young interventional cardiologists. Uh, the leader of that was our fellow in Massey a few years ago, Kentaro. 
and they have built a web-based community with blogs plus a database and they are examining all the things in the field of TAVI, VAC criteria, patient subgroups. They have already in six years 84 manuscripts and more than 3,000 patients being included in the database. A source of constant inspiration, and we had a nice uh, meeting this morning with the founder of the European Bifurcation Club. You probably know this club. It's a club of experts with dedicated values. They have designed and published two randomized clinical trials. They have annual consensus statement and an initiative in the ARC uh, Academic Research Consortium. And this is very important for us to, ref to think about that. We hear what is the spirit of this club and, and feel inspiration from them to start our club. So we think this initiative is timely uh, with the coming results of pivotal trials. We expect the recommendations to be upgraded. This will potentially trigger a huge demand for the procedure. We are not yet ready for that. And we need uh, to be there on time with the procedure and with our hospitals. Our values today, in the name of the group, is to build with you a club of expert physicians with renowned professionalism, integrity, core values, ambition, dedication known to deliver. We are, as a group, a source of proposals for research and education to societies, ESC, EAPCI, EHRA, to companies, and thank you for being there, but also to meetings, PCR, TVT, TCT. So, thank you for coming. Um, we decided for the first edition to focus on the procedural aspects of the procedure. We couldn't uh, overview everything from the planning to the post-procedure treatment, and we decided to focus on procedural aspects. Please be interactive, be creative, innovative, be curious, be ambitious. Don't hesitate to participate, and let's go beyond the usual ways. We would like to thank you, our sponsors. We couldn't do that without you. So thank you very much from the bottom of the heart to Boston, Abbott, LifeTech, and GE. Uh, we had a great interaction before the meeting, and we need you. And thank you to Mediate, Alexandra, and Benjamin. Thank you for your professionalism and your help in preparing this session. Thank you. Are you getting access to my slides? I just do this. Okay. So, um, as a second introduction to what Philippe has said, so first of all, uh, I would like to welcome everybody here. Um, you have uh, all great experts and contributors to the field. I will just give a small summary of the, of the landscape about the current state and unmet needs, as Philippe has already alluded some some part of it. Um, so, when you look at the remaining challenges with LA closure, uh, there is a lot actually. There is a lot uh, that we need to take into account. Uh, we have to talk on how to optimize the procedure, and there's a lot to say about that. There is still, uh, with the increased number of cases that are performed worldwide, uh, something to do about the efficacy and, and to keep its, its procedure as safe as possible. There are new complications that are coming up now uh, that have more uh, focus attention like device leaks and device related thrombus and we need also to to be able to uh, to tackle this uh, this these complications if we look first at the efficacy and safety data what we know now is that if you take for example the example of the US when uh, there, there is an explosion actually uh, in the number of procedures 
we see that still it, it, it has become a relatively, no, not relatively, actually it's a safe procedure because when you look at the procedural success, then we can still discuss about what is the definition of procedural success, but it's extremely high actually, and if you look at the, the, the rate of major complication, it's extremely low, and one that really uh, you have to look for, it's the death related to the procedure, which is less than 0.3%, and this is consistent in all the recent registries, meaning that this has become a very, very safe procedure. Regarding the clinical data, we still, at the time being, have the result of only three randomized trials that have compared uh, LA closure to uh, OAC, I would say, so first vitamin K antagonist in two trials, and uh, the, the last one, uh, the PRAC-17 trial, it was uh, against DOAC. But we have only, at the time being, these three randomized uh, trials published uh, as, as a comparison to, to our anticoagulation. And what it shows, actually, that in terms of stroke rate, uh, it's equivalent. There is a small trend for more ischemic events uh, in, the, in the ELAC group. But on the other hand, you have less hemorrhagic stroke, so probably less disabling stroke as compared to the NOAC group. The second thing is that in terms of uh, other outcome, like a very important one, mortality, it seems that it favors actually LA closure uh, in terms of mortality. This has to be, of course, confirmed in the, in the upcoming trials. And in terms of bleeding, it is obvious that when you go beyond the procedural period, when you have, or you are beyond the intense antitraumatic treatment that you give to prevent DRT, there is a, definitely a decrease over time in, the, in, in major non-procedural bleeding. So this is obvious, and this is one of the main advantage of closing the appendage. So if we pull all together the data, and, and for example, the annual rate of stroke in all the different registries, randomized trials, we see it's relatively consistent. There is a very low rate of stroke when you close the appendage, and this rate of stroke is always, always lower than what you could expect based on the chance vask, always. There's a big reduction. And that's why, with the accumulation of, of this effective uh, data, we see that uh, the guidelines in the U.S. is extremely recent, have upgraded uh, the recommendation from 2B to 2A. And you see the, the, the sentence from the, from the document that in view of the additional data on safety, this is a major point, the safety this has become a very safe procedure, and efficacy of LAO devices, the class of recommendation has been upgraded for the use of this device in patients with long-term contraindication to anticoagulation. And there is a plenty of ongoing, completed, uh, very important clinical trials that will uh, be published uh, in the upcoming months or years. Uh, and uh, we, you see, for example, the Champion F, Catalyst, Champion F has completed the follow-up, uh, the, the inclusion of the patient. Catalyst also is ongoing. There's a lot of other trials, very important one, occlusion AF, stroke close in patients with hemorrhagic stroke. So there is a wealth of data that will coming in the next few years that will confirm uh, probably, I hope, the safety and efficacy of this procedure in a wide uh, variety of patient population. Going now to the procedure optimization, how to optimize the procedure. For many years, people have used this uh, 2D uh, uh, imaging during the procedure. For example, you, you know these four uh, T views uh, from 0 to 135. And only recently, people have moved to a 3D imaging because the appendage is a more complex structure. It's mostly the, uh, the landing zone is elliptical, so the, you have sometimes a wide difference between the maximum and the minimum diameter. So most of the operators uh, in Europe, I think, have moved to a more um, uh, accurate definition of, of the landing zone. Uh, but still, it's not well implemented, and we don't know exactly what is the, the current use of uh, 3D imaging modality in, in real life practice. And on top of that, CT gives a lot of other information. Uh, of course, it's less invasive than TE, but also you can, um, you can also have very important information related to where to puncture the septum, for example, what is the optimal CRM projection. So many, many advantages can be uh, provided by a, a careful CT analysis uh, before the procedure. And that's why uh, some operators have moved now to a different sizing strategy. For example, if you take only into account the maximum diameter of the landing zone, 
in a very elliptical uh, uh, appendage, I mean, you will probably, uh, that would probably lead to uh, extreme oversizing and probably procedural failure. So it's very important to take into account the real uh, diameters of the appendage and to take into account its structure, which most of the time is elliptical. And the more elliptical is the structure, the more you will need to refine your, your uh, sizing strategy. This is also something that we need to define uh, as operators and, and when you teach to new implanters how to size, it's extremely important. So when you look at recent data, because I only took into account very recent data, uh, I found this study, a recent study uh, from, from China, when they randomized actually a patient to pre-planning with CT versus non-CT. And what they basically show is that the CT pre-planning increased the efficiency of the procedure, meaning that actually you have less intraoperative angiographic position, you have a, a lower number of occluder use. It's very important that you don't change during the, during, during the, the procedure, the size of the occluder because that's better, you, you have uh, less changing of, uh, of catheters and things that are less complication. It also increased the first attempt successful occlusion and apparently it also has an effect on the operation time which was significantly decreased in this relatively small trial. We have also data from the Swiss Apero trial. Um, the Swiss approach trial was a randomized, uh, multi-center randomized comparison between uh, Watchman 2.5 Flex and Amulet. And um, in this study, the protocol initially um, didn't allow the operator to use the CT. CT was only there to exclude thrombus and to look at the anatomy, but operator were blinded. And during the course of the trial, when uh, it was obvious that CT was a very important tool for pre-planning, they allowed now the operator to use uh, CT uh, for planning their cases. And so we have a nice comparison between uh, the same operator that first were unblinded and then became uh, so for, for first they were blinded and then became unblinded to the city. And what the study showed actually is that unblinding to CT was associated with a three times more um, uh, increase in short term and two times more increase in long term procedural success. So more successful procedure, less device change, less complication, so a better outcome for the patient by using CT. And another thing that you can have with CT is to add an artificial intelligence. And, for, and we know that, for example, the FELP software, which allows to simulate um, within the appendage what will be the, 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 um, the conformation of the device with different size, different position, and things like that, that allows you to simulate what will be the device into the appendage. And this has been shown in this uh, randomized trial as compared to classical CT pre-planning, that it was, in, it was associated with a very nice uh, outcomes. For example, uh, uh, um, uh, a 40% uh, more complete occlusion of the appendage, and also uh, in any kind of increase in procedure efficiency. For example, less uh, re uh, recapture of the device, uh, use of the, of the first device uh, in a successful way, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Despite all these advantages, when you look at the current practice in real life, and we have data from the US, we see that CT is really uh, seldomly used, actually, uh, when you look at, uh, for example, the experience in the US, around only one-fifth of the, of the cases are done with pre-planning with CT. And there's a wide variation between the hospitals, as, as you can see here. And in this very large uh, data set from, from the NCDR registry in the US, we see that actually the use of CT is very modestly uh, associated with an increase in implant success, device success, et cetera. And paradoxically, also with an increase in 45-day residual leak. And we don't know probably if, for example, the patient that were referred for CT were more complex patient, leading to more complex procedure and probably more leak. So not very clear, but what we can see from this real life uh, document is that uh, actually it's very seldomly used uh, despite all the advantages that I have uh, quoted before. What, what else about uh, optimization of the procedure? I think that now with the increase in the volume of the procedure, people want to have uh, something that goes faster. And uh, a mini-invasive approach uh, is becoming standard in many, many centers and, and countries in Europe. And uh, for example, here I show you a result of a recent uh, study uh, with the Watchman Flex. Uh, this was the, the ICE LA study. Just to show you that they, they, they ended up with excellent result in terms of mortality, uh, uh, procedural success. But this was performed by a very experienced ICE operator. It's very important to emphasize that pre-procedural 3D imaging were used in 
all the cases, so very important that they had a good planning uh, before coming to the lab. And the median procedural time, I mean, time from venous puncture to sheet removal was around 50 minutes, which can seem a little bit long, but it doesn't say anything about the turnover in the cat lab, which probably is improved by using uh, ice-guided uh, LA closure. But what is the situation in the U.S.? Because this is real life. And we see in the U.S. that despite all these advantages of a more mini-invasive approach, only 6% of the procedure uh, over a 15-month period were performed with ICE guidance. So very few cases, actually. And uh, with also with a slow uh, variation over time, you see that actually uh, this 6 7% remains stable over, over the, the course of the, of, the, of the study period. And what we see here in the U.S., from the U.S. experience, is that actually there's no difference in uh, device implant success. Uh, Compact seal is the same. Uh, very strangely, I mean, uh, even with the use of ice, you see that 62% uh, of ice-guided procedures were done with general anesthesia, which is relatively strange, but it's like that. And in terms of safety, there was only one signal, it was pericardial effusion that was increased, significantly increased because this is a large number of patients with only a 0 0.5 uh, absolute difference, but which was actually uh, significant. And also we see in this study that uh, the more you perform ice-guided procedure, the less you have complication, the less you have procedural time, and the less you have contrast uh, injection. So it's very important to emphasize that there was a wide variability in the experience of the operator with ice, with some operators doing only uh, less than 10 procedures per year. And uh, another way to do that, and we'll discuss that uh, tomorrow, uh, it's uh, the miniaturized TE guidance, because it also allows for uh, performing the case without general anesthesia. And we have performed this uh, multicenter registry. Actually, it's not a lot of centers, not a lot of patients, but we show that actually it was a, a safe way to perform the procedure with a high technical success and procedural rate. And also something nice from this uh, registry was the use of pre-procedural 3D imaging, whether it was uh, CT or 3D TE, was associated with the 100% success rate as compared to 95% when using 2D procedural. TE. So this was summarized in this nice editorial. Uh, I mean, we'll discuss that tomorrow, uh, the, the drawbacks and the advantages of each imaging modality during the procedure. But there's a lot to say about that, I think, uh, how to maximize the efficacy of the procedure with imaging. Uh, regarding device leaks, uh, you have, we have new insights, we have uh, new kids on the block. I would say uh, here we, we see that uh, recently, very recently, we have seen that uh, uh, on the long-term follow-up of the Watchman trials, the, f the fact to have a, a leak, which was seen as a, something that uh, well, had no impact on the clinical outcome, now is seen as, a, as something that can increase the risk of ischemic event. This was shown in the Watchman trials. This was also shown in a large data set from the NCDR LAO registry, although the difference was relatively uh, small, but it was significant. And there was also a trend in the AMULET, uh, randomized trial, uh, AMULET ID randomized trial uh, for this um, for, for an increase in thrombolic, thromboembolic events with, uh, with the presence of the leak. And we have uh, this very nice uh, meta-analysis from the group of uh, Apostolos, which has gathered uh, more than 60,000 cases from 48 trials, um, and they have assessed actually what is the outcome of the peri-device leak uh, after appendage closure. And what we see first is that it's quite common. I mean, 26% of the patients have some kind of leak uh, during the follow-up. What we see is that a very large leak, which is defined as PDL of more than five millimeters, is, is, remains extremely rare, and this is consistent uh, within all the different trials. It's less than one percent. But, but pre device leak more than three millimeters is relatively frequent. It's close to 10 percent. And what we see is that if you have a leak as compared to no leak, that increases the risk of thrombotic events first. The second thing is that there is a stepwise increase in the risk of thrombotic events with the severity of the leak. And what is new in this trial, we know the cutoff of five millimeter is with this meta-analysis, it shows that even a three millimeter cutoff is dangerous actually for the patient. It's dangerous and it increases the risk of thrombotic. So there is something to do about that. 
And another very important finding from this meta-analysis is uh, the CT uh, assessment of per device leak, or if you, if you want LA patency. First, it's very frequent. As you can see, it's uh, more than 50% of the cases have patency or leak on CT. So it's something that you, you find very commonly uh, when you do a CT follow-up. And here we see that it has no prognostic significance. So it challenged a little bit the value of CT as a prognostic tool for leak. Although it, I think it's very good to see the mechanism and to, to plan a closure, but for the prognosis, probably it's, uh, it's, um, it's less, uh, less good than T. So this is something also that we can discuss uh, during the meeting. What we don't know from this meta-analysis is what was, what was the mechanism of, of the leak, because we can imagine that different mechanisms can lead to different um, consequences. For example, if you have a large uncovered uh, proximal lobe, for example, probably it's not the same as having something like a uh, small per device leak or even a three millimeter, which is really per device, uh, maybe it has not the same consequence. So we don't know exactly if you can link the mechanism and the severity and to see what we can do with that. Do we have to close, do we have to treat, do we have to, to, to increase the OAC or whatever? It's not clear. It is, this is really an un unmet need that we need to, um, to, to, to see together. When we look at device-related thrombus, uh, it's, uh, it's becoming a problem because uh, of the number of, uh, of cases that you are performing. So, uh, I mean, on average, the, the, the rate is between two to four percent if you take into account large series. So everybody here, when you, you have a large uh, LAO program, you will face this complication for sure. So you need to be able to detect, to manage it, and so on. Uh, the thing is that also we thought at the beginning that like it was early, but it's not so early. I will just come back. Uh, we see, for example, in this meta-analysis that uh, half of the patients are diagnosed uh, beyond uh, uh, three months, and in the LODRT registry, one third of the patients were diagnosed after six months. And if you if and if you look at the at the right, you see that 20 percent, one fifth of the patients were diagnosed beyond one year. So, uh, I mean, we need to see when to, to detect it. And there is no uh, debate that it has a clinical consequence now, because now we have a lot of data showing that when you have DRT, this is associated with a four to five time increase in the rate of stroke, although the, the, the time relationship between the DRT and the, and the stroke is not always uh, clear. And uh, I would say that in half of the case, there is a strong time relationship. And sometimes it's extremely uh, not obvious that uh, it was related to the, to, the, to the DRT, the stroke was related to the DRT. Um, what are the risk factors? A lot of uh, studies have tried to assess the different risk factors. And some of them are relatively uh, come in different uh, registries. But uh, one important one that we can uh, try to minimize as operator is the device implant depth. And we have very uh, recent data showing that actually when the device is implanted too deep in the appendage, that increases actually the risk of DRT. This was, I would say, um, suggested by some small uh, registries, and now it has been confirmed uh, in this very nice paper uh, led by uh, Chavi uh, that implant depth, when you, go, when you implant the device too deep, actually you increase significantly as an independent factor the risk of device rated thrombus. And the more deep you are, the more you increase the, this risk uh, as shown here in this graph. What about the antithrombotic strategy to prevent DRT? It's actually it's a, it's a frustrating area because we don't know what to do, actually. Uh, uh, when we look, for example, at the LAO DRT registry, we see that uh, there is no clear difference between the medication at discharge and the occurrence of DRT. In the evolution uh, large uh, registry with the Watchman 2.5, it seems that giving a NOAC or vitamin K antagonist is associated with the lowest rate, but it's not randomized, of course. Um, what it's coming up, it's that probably uh, the fact to use a low-dose DOAC could be, could be a good option to consider in the future. And there are uh, several randomized trials assessing this new strategy, low-dose DOAC, a short trial low-dose DOAC, and ADALA was uh, presented by Xavi and was positive actually during Europe-PCR, and I guess, I guess it's, uh, it's going to be published soon. And also the ANDES trial and the other trial that we see at the FATE DRT that will uh, try to uh, answer this question. So what about when you have a DRT, what is the resolution rate? We see that in, I would say, uh, 
almost 30, 20 to 30 percent of the patient, you have no resolution of DRT. So this is a problem, actually. And in that case, it is associated with a worse outcome. And even if you have a resolution, uh, we see that uh, it can come back uh, after follow-up imaging. When you perform follow-up imaging, for example, in this uh, multicenter registry, we see that after initial resolution, there was a recurrence in one-third of the patient population. And this was also shown in the, in the LAO DRT registry uh, at a lower level, but still around almost 20% of the patient had a recurrence after initial resolution. And they found only one predictor actually on this uh, on multivariate analysis. It was the inial cell size of the thrombus of more than seven millimeter. The, the other thing that we need to discuss, uh, maybe not during this meeting, but uh, it's uh, the definition of, of DRT, how to detect it. So there are very clear TE definition that have been published that are validated and okay and now also there recently there has been this uh, uh, publication uh, in Jack uh, that have uh, implemented new criteria using CT uh, to detect because CT has a really a higher sensitivity to detect any kind of uh, um, small endotelization at the level of the device so it's sometimes difficult to differentiate uh, normal healing as compared to a DRT. So now we have at least suggested criteria that probably we need to uh, validate uh, within a larger uh, registry. So I just come back to my first slide. There's a lot, a lot of unmet needs that we need to, uh, to tackle together. And I hope that this meeting will help us to, to advance in this field and to, uh, to tailor our procedure, uh, to tailor our post-procedure treatment, and to, to go for a good pre-planning. Of course, we'll focus on the procedure, which is very important. So thank you very much. So without any delay, uh, I just uh, try, I, I will invite uh, Jens Erik uh, to start the next very, very important session. He will introduce the ELAC Research Registry. Okay, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, at this first uh, meeting for the ELAC club. And a very strong ambition for us with this uh, club is actually to initiate a European research registry for LAAC. I mean, instead of doing studies where we have a few hundred patients, we can work together and we can make large studies with thousands of patients. We can make research more, much more impactful, we can answer much more questions. We don't need to see uh, three of similar studies going on in three different countries. If we talk together and collaborate, we can really make this much more impactful. So, uh, can I also see my slides up here? No, I can only see them here. Yeah. Okay, that's better for me here. So, um, as we have heard, uh, LAC is now increasing extremely rapidly, especially uh, in USA. And we still only have few randomized trials. We have, as Adele has alluded to, uh, still uh, many open questions that we need uh, to answer. One other thing is that we have a very fast development of technology. We see one type of uh, device, we see new iteration of the same device, third iterations, we see a totally new concept coming up. We see new uh, tools for imaging, new tools for transeptual puncture, steerable sheets, etc. We need to evaluate all those new uh, tools. Are they really worth it? Uh, will it? Will it improve the field? and we need to collaborate to answer all those uh, questions. So uh, one way to go uh, is of course to do the randomized clinical trials, but uh, we need also to do real life data registries. And we have already in the LAC field a number of uh, different LAC uh, registries. We have seen company-driven registries like the ACP, Amulet, Flexibility, Post-Market Studies, 
and you all know they have really created uh, very useful data. We have single center registries, multi-center registries, we have country-driven registries, we have even continent-driven registries like the US registry, and we have some driven by uh, well-defined problems like DRT, the International DRT Registry, and the Europe DRT Registry. I will uh, really uh, try to highlight this uh, US uh, registry for LAAC. Uh, this is a package. The ACC is supporting in US a package of databases uh, for cardiovascular uh, data. The NCDR, the National Cardiovascular Disease Registries in US. And as you can see, it's not only about LAAC, it's also about acute myocardial infarction, uh, it's about um, ICD units, it's about peripheral vascular interventions. Among all those also, LAAC is found there. And this registry was uh, initiated back in February 2016. And one very unique thing with this registry is that in order to get reimbursed your procedure in US, you actually have to, uh, to uh, enroll your data into this uh, registry for each single patient. Otherwise, you will not get e economical reimbursement. So that means that um, the data integrity and uh, almost all US patients having a LAC procedures into this registry, which is also now a very, very large registry with more than 100,000 patients. And all of you in the auditorium will also be aware of a, a number of very high quality and important publications. This is just, just one of the latest one uh, dealing with post-procedural antithrombotic therapy for Watchman Flex, but if you Look at the list, there's a number of publications related to different topics, pre-procedural imaging, device migration, embolization, device sizing, endpoint adjudication, safety effect effectiveness, indications for LAO, antithrombotic therapy, residual leaks, uh, pericardial effusion, clinical outcomes, sex differences, etc. There's a number of very uh, good publications from this registry, also in very uh, good impact uh, cardiology uh, journals. If you go to the website for the NCDR LAU registry, you can find actually uh, their exact data collection form, and this is a huge document. I tell you, it has all information about demographics, it has all information about pre-procedural uh, work up, the procedure, procedural complications, and it's actually a document of 18 pages, so it's quite requiring uh, for uh, the implanter to uh, fill out this form. But nevertheless, it has resulted in a very, very good surveillance in US of the therapy. We need to develop something that are even better here in Europe. Why shouldn't we do that? We have an enormous potential in Europe to have very high quality patient follow-up. We have a very good tradition for all our patients coming back to follow-up imaging, and we can do even better than they can do in US with uh, their US uh, uh, also very nice registry. So I think we should aim to develop a large-scale European registry for left atrial appendage closure. The purpose should be to really assess what is the real-world procedural outcome here in Europe with this therapy. We can evaluate short and long-term safety. We can compare devices, we can look at uh, device efficacy for new concept of devices, we can compare safety efficacy for various devices, we can use this registry for stimulating collaborations and research, we can in the end improve the procedure and patient outcome, and we can also make this a tool to increase the awareness and also 
stimulate expansion of the left atrial appendage closure procedure. So today we are actually going to uh, present for you a very um, quite detailed uh, suggestion of a web-based European registry for LAC and we have uh, done a lot of work already on beforehand to consider uh, some of the relevant uh, parameters but today we want interaction with you we want your feedback on how detailed should such a register be how can we make sure that you as uh, implanting sites are interested in enrolling your data how can we make sure that every patient will go into this and it should be made practical easy and for you so the platform that we uh, will suggest for this registry is uh, the REDCap uh, type of uh, data collection software. You probably know it. Uh, you can see that there is a very uh, high number of uh, institutions in the world that have access to this. And my guess will be that probably all of you in the room, in your own institutions, you have already access to REDCap. So this will really make things and life easier because everything about data protection has already been taken care of in this software package. It's GDPR ready. You don't have to speculate about data safety uh, and things like that. So it's more or less uh, plug and play uh, with uh, this platform. Uh, to use this platform uh, to a new European ELAC uh, research registry. Like ACC in the US are supporting this NCDR package of uh, registries. We also have European Society of Cardiology and they have a similar, uh, not at the moment uh, extensive uh, approach to the same thing, but they have a group of registries collected under ESC. There's a few, uh, one uh, related to chronic uh, coronary syndrome, one related to heart failure, uh, one uh, re related to pacing and, and other topics. I don't think the time is ready now to go directly and become an ESC registry, but giving the near future with expansion of LAAC or maybe even explosion could be the right wording. It could be in the future maybe relevant to also try to let our registry uh, be part of a ESC package. But I think we should start uh, humble and uh, start uh, with this red cap uh, platform and, and uh, make it uh, easy and we also with this want a quick start. We don't want to wait for one, two, three years. We could have done this five, ten years ago, but the timing is good now. We are just facing uh, some of the large trials coming out like the option trial, later on Catalyst and Champion AF, so there will be a huge increase in LAAC procedures and that's really calls upon a systematic registration of what we are doing and new devices, new technology. So I really hope that you see the same need in your institutions for a systematic collection of data. And it will be a pleasure now uh, actually to introduce for you this uh, very uh, this this uh, platform that we have uh, worked out. So uh, I will give the word now to Savvy and uh, also uh, call upon Anas uh, Kramer. Yeah. So uh, Savvy, can you sure. uh, talk a little bit uh, about how you got entry to this uh, European database? Yeah, I don't know if we can just like. Um Serve so maybe if not we can we can ask. So basically, um, well, and this 
deserves just to be said. I mean, it's a work of, of the Janseric team. So they, they've been using REDCap for a long time, I think, and they create the database. I mean, they share it, we could review it, but we could not imagine, you know, a better way um, just to show, to discuss the variables than, you know, showing and maybe feel one, one patient. So basically, and Janseric, uh, I would highlight three points about REDCap. The most important thing that it's, as you said, it's a secure platform. So we, most of the institutions, universities, and even in research, you know, they're using this platform. So we don't have to be worried about security, hacking, and, and extra things of that. And the second thing that it's important, it's by, you know, using this um, tool, you're not supposed to share from the very beginning the data. So you can use, use it as a particular, as a single user, or you have the opportunity to share and just to use it in a, in a you know, more global aspect. The only thing and the most important thing is just to talk the same language and that we can export in Excel because this can be exported into Excel and then that everybody of us here um, has exactly the same variables and the same structure. So it will be much easier to share and build new, new um, projects. So I don't know if you can, Anders, just to start. Yeah, definitely. I don't know if these are on. Maybe they are. On. This one is on. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so just a uh, short introduction. Uh, this is the landing or this is the landing page of the, of the red cap. Uh, Savvy has been kind enough to log into his account using uh, two-factor authentication and everything. So even there, it's really safe. And uh, entered a test patient here this morning, I believe. So uh, do we want us to go through your test patient here? So, uh, yeah, well, I mean, or we can create a new one. I mean, yeah, let's I do that. that it's, but it's uh, good. So what we expect, and we will go like um, part by part, so if, if you can, you know, be, be interactive, because at the end, it's what we're supposed to use all together. So if you're feeling that we're missing something, so you tell us. Um, also consider the balance between, you know, like something straightforward, easy, not too complex, not too, you know, difficult to, to fulfill, but something that then we, we're not going to miss in the future and we have to go back. So let's start. Before you continue, maybe it would be interesting to hear the voices from in the audience, like who thinks this is interesting, who would like to participate, uh, what are caveats here? It would be interesting to hear some voices from the audience. I, I think it's an interesting uh, idea and I, I would like to participate, but uh, I don't know how do you, um, the purpose is to include all the procedures that we we do and are you going, I mean, there is going to be um, like a control uh, or an external reviewer or, or it's just uh, like we fill our database in the hospital, so we feel like uh, we've, we've uh, complete this database. So it's like an alternative database, or? Well, probably this is not, it, it's something that we already discussed. This might be in a second, you know, um, stage where we can get more, you know, just um, support. But at this moment, it's like sharing your data. I mean, the good thing about this is that you can do it res retrospectively, so you can feel all the patients that you have, and you can do it prospectively. And, and at the end, the objective would be that your institution, you, I mean, your service, your department, uses this red cap, and this can be used for Tower and other stuff, this platform to have the control of your, of your LAA patients. And, and if you start to use it, you'll see that it's a very, yeah, very useful tool. But at the end, of course, if we have lab, um, independent committees assignating, that would be much better. But it's not, I guess, the purpose at this early stage. Maybe that might be like a, a future objective, but um, I don't know, like the rest, you know, of the team would. But the sharing of the data, for example, if you, you, you can, you, is then the proposal you use this as your, you can use this as your own database for yourself. You can say, okay, now I have a database, we move it all over into that, and that we use as the, 
future database, but you only share on a project basis, yes? I mean, yeah, it's only, patient, you, share the you don't want to you share want. your data all the time. Exactly, I mean, so you're not um, sharing all your patients or your series with everybody. Mm -hmm. So you have your, you know, your window, you have your own registry, and then like somebody says, okay, let's collect, I don't know, patients with Watchman or Amulet, so then you share those patients. This is like the, the aim of the registry because of course, like nobody likes to have all your patients, you know, um, you know like um, that can be shared like from the very beginning. It's always under your control, always. Yeah. Like as a single user or as a multi-centric user. So you share what you want, but you can use it, you know, um, your own data and if you don't wanna share, you don't share. But at least you're using the same language and a pain point, of course, of these databases, typically, for if I look to myself, it's easy to get the data in from baseline procedural characteristics because you do it right after the procedure. But having follow-up data in that database, that may be for 80% of patients in the database empty because you don't type these in. So how do you filter that out? How do you, are these usable then or not? Or depends from the project you do, but I can imagine that's a pain point. Yes. Yeah, well, that's, that's, you know, like, uh, might be, you know, like just a, a problem, but I mean, it, here is a commitment, no, um, that everybody tries just to do our best, no, and, and no, try no. just to get the, the best right. data, yeah. Maybe it would be interesting mm -hmm. to know who in the room is already running a reg history prospectively, maybe hands up, who is already running a prospective reg history, and who is not? Okay, and uh, what are the considerations of those who run the registry? Would you think that this uh, would be a good moment uh, to unify forces and to participate, or you see it rather critical, or what would be the conditions under which you would decide uh, to, to collaborate? Now, it would be interesting to know, no? Yeah, exactly. It's like, um, it's an example, no? We, we, we've been like doing with here people like a lot of research projects. So then, for example, you know, like just valvular patients. Then you have to go back, recheck all the patients, you know, because everybody of us that have different variables, different data sets, and, and it's a lot of work. With this platform, you know, all of us, you know, will we'll use the same, you know, um, semantic, the same for Excel. So it would be super easy to get, you know, the data like this, if we are like updated in our, in our data set. So I think that I... created by me database, we will collect the data in the, let's say, in the form of such, a, such database. The database will be in my position or in my hands. Yeah. And I will decide at a certain point, okay, let's collect the data together. So I will still have an access and let's say my own database, yeah? Is it like that? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So the structure uh, now for how all the users are connected to the database is that you have all the time you have access to your own part of the database, the patients entered by your login or uh, a team that is as your team. Uh, um, and of course there's some administrative uh, rights that you can override that, but uh, for you as a user and a user group, you only you can access your own uh, patients, and you have access to them all the time. And we are not able to see your patients and and vice versa. And and what I've seen that maybe you can show later that you can have even stats like easy stats, um, of your of your data. So I don't know how many patients with whatever, and it's like this, like really easy. So I think that we should start because otherwise we have only 30 minutes. Um, yeah. Let's go with demographics and then let's discuss if you agree with the uh, yeah. with the uh, data. I don't know, Nina. So we'll add a new uh, patient here. So uh, these are our, these are our instruments as they are called in uh, in a red cap, and uh, we start out by demographics. So I, why don't you fill a, a patient and let's let's see? Yes, we can take one from uh, from your sensor here. Okay. So here you can have like as many hospitals as you want. Um, here you see that, of course, gender. Say, uh, they are Today. a very uh, standard uh, LAO patient here. So they are approximately 75 years old or something along those lines. Uh, Let's say 
very average height and weight, I guess, as well. Oh. And it comes up with a warning if I have entered the, the, the data wrong, but uh, it's just a, a control that says, are you sure this is the correct? So you can override it. There's a chest vest score here. It calculates itself. Let's say this uh, patient had a prior stroke. He also had a TIA, but it doesn't add to, to, the, to the score because they are the same in the score. And he gets one from being above uh, 65 as well, and it's not quite 75 yet. Uh, let's say he has had a major bleeding of some kind and uh, also has an abnormal liver function here. It calculates his uh, has bed score as well. In between, if you have the impression that something important is missing, um, yeah. just let us know and tell us because this could something which could be implemented on the long term. I mean, th this was one of the most important, you know, objectives of this meeting that tried to get a consensus for this that we can start working you know, in the same database. So again, you know, with the idea of not being too complex, but not missing anything. Yes. So you have the renal function, you have the ejection fraction, and yes. then you have the indication. Yeah, and uh, he had uh, some kind of major bleeding here, and uh, maybe he's also at a risk of falling, uh, and has uh, atrial fibrillation here, paroxysmal. Uh, so what just about a yeah, sorry, uh, Javi, just a question. Like if, you, um, if you want to um, say that we have another bleeding, um, how do we implement this? This, for example, so if he had an something ocular bleeding in or something like that? Yeah. No, okay, yeah. So you can push uh, other here, and uh, we get a, a comments section down here. Uh, we'll have to move that up so that it reflects the bleeding part, yeah, or the indications part. But we can say ocular bleeding here. Yeah. So maybe here, you know, like just um, for the um, arrhythmia, maybe something other arrhythmias like a flutter that some people, you know, mm. also yeah, good point. Just puts anticoagulation. I think that that would be maybe something good. And then if you put um, non um, hypercoagulative disorder, then you have a window. Then we can by, yeah. a drop down menu here. And Javi, uh, Javi, how do you differentiate uh, major from uh, non major but clinically relevant bleeding? Do, do you have a, do you have an item to differentiate? But sometimes you have major. Sometimes it's clinically relevant, but n not fulfilling the major definition. Yeah, actually we don't have here in the demographics page, uh, when we get to the clinical outcomes uh, page, I have uh, written uh, or copied the definitions from uh, the papers, the, their respective papers. Uh, but, uh, but we can definitely work it into the, the demographics part as well. It's uh, gonna take up a little space, but uh, maybe we can add it if you say major bleeding here, then you can double check that it is uh, actually the, the correct uh, definitions. Yeah, I think this is important to be mm. at the same level. So for everybody who's filling it out, it should be very clear. To streamline it, yeah. You can add non-major but clinically relevant. Yeah. The, that, yeah. That will... I have a question is... How do you handle uh, missing data? Because when you go to analysis, it's important to know whether uh, the information was missing or you just forget to enter it. How is it handled in RECAP? I don't know, because this mm. is of crucial importance that you can select missing actively to prove that you looked at the item and you confirm that it's not available, because otherwise it can be a mess once you ana analyze Yeah. But that's a good point for all of the fields here. I don't know, uh, I don't think RECAP has a uh, a built-in per se uh, option to do that, but when you finish up, let's say, this instrument on demographics here, you can say complete, uh, and uh, if it is some of the must provide values within here, if they are missing, it, uh, it tells you that you are missing those. So it has a, it's trying to catch you if you, if you, if you miss those values, but of course, uh, I can't know if you were just in a hurry that day or if, uh, and, and didn't do it, or if the values aren't actually there. So have you, a you don't have a chance? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then you know that the data are not available to you. Yeah. Okay, so I think we, we need to move because, like, yeah. 15 Xavier, minutes. Um, uh, yes. Just one point. In the, uh, Sorry, it's important for, for our colleagues that uh, have a, um, a personal database on, um, for example, uh, uh, Excel. It's possible to import 
from Excel directly. Um, that can I think it's like both ways. I mean, here you can export to Excel. Import to Excel, so, import but, from but Excel. But if you have to insert <coughs> 300 patients in the database, it's completely different if you can realize a semi-automatic I don't think that, you know, like from Excel to here, if it's in another format, would be like really difficult. Eh? Uh, it is possible to import from I Excel suppose that to uh, RedCop. Maybe, Cap yes. Eric, you have experience. It should be possible to import Excel files into uh, RedCap, yeah, and vice versa, actually. But in the, in the format but, of but the database. But he has some experience. With yeah, yeah, of Not course. In one, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I, I, I honestly think that, that um, of course, you can do either way, but of course, you know, like if you export from Excel, it's gonna be in the code of the, of the, the, the you know, like the origin database. Yeah. So then it's gonna be a mess. I think that, you know, if you were just planning to do it retrospectively, you have to go, you know, again, you know, yeah, one we, by, by one, you know. And, and that's we imported recently and um, we were able to import some of the values, but not all of the values, and, and the other ones we just have to, uh, yeah, correct retrospectively. Yeah, so uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, if you want to import from Excel to RedCap, you have to make sure that the codes for each of your variables matches exactly the ones in RedCap, right? Yeah. So you would have to go through your old uh, database uh, data and, and adjust that accordingly. So for example, devices, if you have a list of devices, then they're, in RedCap they're numbered like one uh, amyl or two mm. women. And then if you have it in your database in, in wording, that will not transfer. You have to nah. tra you have to uh, transpose the wording to uh, numbers and then and then import. Okay. Yeah, so agree. let's move um, because we're still in the baseline and yeah. So uh, let's say uh, autic stenosis here has known valvular disease and he has a bioprosthetic valve here. Here it's missing tricuspid because now there we have a lot of patients and it can have an impact in liver function. So I think it's important. Yeah. Okay. And then the, there's this section on, uh, on uh, therapy initiated after the proce procedure and the uh, therapy discontinued in, in, uh, in, in terms of... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it might be of interest when it was discontinued. Yeah. Is uh, this possible to edit? Yes, uh, if you uh, choose here, let's say you initiated uh, aspirin here, it, gets you, it gives you a date, uh, it's the same date usually as the, or maybe the <laughs> day before and the P2Y12 inhibitor here, and it's the same as today. And if you choose these ones, it will ask you for specifics. So I'm sorry, let's say clopidogrel here. In the valvular disease, uh, I, I, <coughs> I would uh, um, precise severe, because otherwise many patients have mild uh, um, mitral regurgitation or stenosis. I, would, I, th I think it's important to underline severe or moderate severe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so you get some options to, uh, to choose between the severities <coughs> here, is what you're saying, yeah. Uh, and then uh, probably one, one. he discontinued, yeah, sorry. Sorry, one, one more point. I think uh, there should be uh, info in, in every tick and, and, and a specification how is it, uh, what it does it mean. So uh, if you have this uh, aortic stenosis, what does it mean? So uh, everybody takes it similarly. Okay. okay. Uh, I think if I choose uh, DOAC here, no, or maybe after the procedure. I, I, add, I added it after the procedure here. Okay, but uh, we, that's, that's easy to do. Older is always a bad option because you can never analyze it. No? Older is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also a way to see if we missed something. That was also my idea with having people really explain what is the other option then if, uh, if we see that uh, many people choose the same or we can, al we can always add another option in the, in the database if, if it's a need. Any yeah. other suggestion from the audience? Are we missing something here? Okay. Did you consider, uh, just one comment about the antithrombotic therapy, did you consider to create a form dedicated to, for the antithrombotic therapy, uh, the medication was started, stopped? 
an indication for stopping the antithrombotic therapy is what I'm hearing, yeah. No, um, I mean, uh, uh, here you see that the, the medication and after uh, procedure, ah. mm -hmm. yes. Uh, so the, to um, create a dedicated form for the, for the antithrombotic therapy where uh, <coughs> you the select the drug and you put the date of begin and the date of stop. But in a sense, it's here. No, I mean, it's like if you were, some, you were taking something and that you stop um, for the intervention, then you could, can put it there in the date. And then if you start, then you start. And then on the follow-up, you will have you know, the chance to, to stop it. But this is baseline. Okay. So in the, the follow-up, I think that's going to be this book. Yeah, well, but it's like the it's one that you see, no? So. Yep, but it's under baseline. It's yeah. pre procedure, what we see here. Yeah, but, the, but it says post LA occlusion. It says post. Ah, okay. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I see. Yeah. Post. I see yeah. the confusion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they said yeah. post. Yeah. 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 And maybe you need um, some information about overlapping indications for the dual antiplatelet treatment, for example, if the patient has coronary artery disease. Okay, yeah. This has an impact. That's, that's a good point. Coronary artery close disease. It because it was point. a triple yeah. treatment and so on. We should put, no? Exactly. That's good. Okay, so we have to. We'll move on to the next form here. So. Uh, yeah. I yeah, will go here to the next form, which is uh, preparation and implantation here. So uh, I guess we perform some kind of uh, pre-procedural imaging. It has options if you use, uh, if you have primary or secondary, but uh, let's say we used uh, a T option here, pre-LAO. Uh, yeah, so the date and I've seen, and uh, you have it's to- It's possible to select both? Yeah, we can do that, device. yeah. Okay. Two options. Yeah, so then the, the uh, cardiac CT details come here first, and we enter, you can enter uh, uh, information related to the, to the CT scan, your measurements during the CT, and then the same goes here for, for the, the TE. So just put 3D, because it can be also, you have also the option just to do to, do yeah. it to the entry, and if it's 3D, again, it opens, you know, to the 3D environment, so, so you have the data. Yes. Here. Yeah. And you can choose here if you have used uh, standard TE or, or one of the, the other what, what happens here if you uh, enter implausible data, for example, uh, office di uh, orifice diameter uh, f uh, six, uh, 600? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see if I made that control here. So you put in a range of values here. Where you should do that. Yeah, yeah then it warns you. It, it's, it doesn't overrule your 600. If you really had a patient with an orifice uh, diameter of 600 millimeters, you can enter that, but, uh, but it, it will just double check. <laughs> Good. So any, any comment on that? So I think that it's pretty complete, this part. Oh, we I have a, a, lot. a yeah. question. There's a lot of parameters, like measuring everything in every angle. The question is if it is really important to have all, and what happens if you don't add anything there, or, or add some of them? Hmm. Are you, it is mandatory to... Uh, put everything in, and regarding the post uh, treatment of uh, uh, antiplatelets, I think it shouldn't be in the first uh, part. It should be after the procedure. Yeah, yeah. It's a good, it's a yeah. Point, yeah. It'd be easier to understand because I also was confused because it was it was a post procedure, so it, it's not part of the baseline characteristic. Yeah, makes sense. Well, here you know about the missing data. It's like having you know a database, shared database that you don't have the value, so you send it without that value. So that would send you know without that value. But for the but people that measure, I think that it's important. But you to need to, to to define some parameters that you cannot leave empty. Some, yeah. If you don't put which device it is, if it's a watchman or something else, yeah. you cannot send the. It won't accept it. And therefore, I think that some parameters should be mandatory, and some, like uh, the angles, uh, it should be. Okay. Th yeah. This is this is very meaningful. It might be might make more sense to um, to give us a maximum diameter and a minimum than a diameter in each of the sections. Yeah, that's a good hint. Yeah. In other words, if I miss perimeter, uh, 
will it be possible to save that page and go farther? Let's say if I perform a TE before and I have only measurements, orifice diameter, and that's it. Will it be possible to go farther or it will be a missing page? Uh, you can continue to the next page. You can also complete the patient, but every time you try and move onwards, it will warn you that you missed those values. So if you don't, if you don't measure these values and they are for, you can, we can choose to set some of the values as mandatory. And if we choose that they are mandatory, it will warn you when you move on. If, if they are not mandatory, you can just move on with empty values. But this, was made, this would make a lot of sense. Yeah. 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 So, so you can move, but it will warn you every time. So, yeah. But you can move. But I guess that's a secondary choice to choosing the values uh, in the first place, then saying uh, which ones uh, are the ones that we think are absolutely uh, core. OK, so let's move on to the LA morphology. Yeah, we'll see if we have to change this after today, uh, maybe, but uh, these, these are the, the ones uh, at the moment. OK, number of lobes. Yeah, gives you suggestions. Um, yeah, do, do you think this would need definition? I mean, um, if you have very distally lobes, is it so important if it's not in the region <coughs> of the landing zone? So how important is mm -hmm. it, and uh, how do we describe a lobe? A lobe is definitely important if it's close to the ostium. Is it really important if it's in three centimeter in the depths and we will never touch mm -hmm. it? So we should define how we, um, how we define a lobe. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think it, the, this section will be redesigned after we have presented yeah, our yeah, presentation. But at least the, the format, yeah. yeah. So, okay, let's go on. Then we go on to the implantation details here. Uh, we can enter that, of course, it was a technical success, at least in 98% of cases. So again, it would be good <laughs> to have you the definition of technical success. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, and, and you can, can enter. Can you choose different devices? Sorry? Can you choose different devices? I mean, you, you attend one, you fail, and you change. Um, ah, okay, yeah. Uh, I don't think we have included no. that option at the moment. You can say a uh, number of uh, recaptures and numbers of devices used, but uh, let's say you started out l using a, a, f a Watchman Flex and ended up with an amulet. That we can't we can't see that. So I mean, good point. It happens in real life. That's yeah. why mm -hmm. it is important. Mm -hmm. Sometimes maybe it's it's good to have like an open field, you know, that you can explain stuff. No? Yeah, but again, with the open field, we, we have, we have problem. a procedural it note. To yeah. Something. But yeah. I would really not provide mm. open fields, that's, no. that's not a good <laughs> idea. Note, and do yeah. you have thrombus present or not in the imaging pre? Come again, sorry. Uh, thrombus present or absent and where it is? Uh, no, before, I think. Uh, I pre imaging. Yeah, 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 I'm on my way up here, I just can't remember. Because yeah, we need two things, uh, uh, thrombi and pericardial effusion, that should be checked exactly. before and we have to need it if it's that's present. Yeah. You, may, you may don't want to know uh, all the values uh, from zero to 135 degrees. Yeah. I mean, at the end, the most relevant is mean, max, and, <laughs> and average, because we should avoid unnecessary data where we probably never will do an analysis. Yeah. So maybe it's Because Trump the problem is if you ask everything, 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 people are not uh, entering it. Oh, it's a balance. And they also not enter the important data. So yeah. we should really stick to the most, most relevant. Yeah, probably this data from ECHO, it's too much. I never measure the, uh, let's say, orifice. Yeah, exactly. If I'm, so what for? And then all the times you will warn me that there are missing data. And then maximum, minimum diameter, w will it be in the landing zone automatically from the measurements upstairs, uh, from which are uh, higher? Or should I put it once again, minimum and maximum diameter? Uh, because uh, the, measuring the distance from the edge to the left upper pulmonary vein, I never measure that. No, so but w what for this data? No, but it's like, but I measure. So I mean, it, it, the thing is that it's good for you, but it's also good for me. So if you want to feel it, you feel it. And if I want to feel everything, I think that I feel. The thing is that you, you can just like leave it blank. But like uh, some people like, like in this, or they want to have like a specific project. So I think that it's good that we don't have to go back to extra measure, no? So if you already have it. So Laura? Yeah, I think, I don't know if it's there because it's a lot of things, but I think that the contractility of the left atrial appendage is also important to put if it's normal or not, because it's not the same to have a very hypocontractile and that's that one with high contract. Well, I think. Sinus rhythm and AF, you know, in yeah, the... But, but, but you know, some patients in sinus rhythm, sometimes they have hypocontractile 
appendage. And, and the thing about thrombus or, or very dense echo contrast, I think this is interesting for the follow-up also. Yeah, but this is even more, more difficult to, uh, to assess. So how do we do it? How yeah. do we, um, yeah. I mean, we could measure it in a, in a diastolic, in a systolic phase, yeah, yeah. but this is... And, and the, only the money. pulsatility with the pulse doppler during the intervention, you know, it's a number. But you can, you, you can assess the peak emptying velocities yeah. and the, a spontaneous echo contrast, and this gives us information about the left atrial pressure and so on. And I would elaborate a little bit more the transeptal access because you have different devices available and it's important to know if somebody uses radio frequency or not, special yeah. measures to make it more safe, safe sept and so and on. And maybe even, you know, like if you're going through the PFO, like something about transeptal, no? Information, mm. technical and, you know, positioning. That's also a good point. So thrombus, um, you know, distal mid or, or protrusion and then this thing about transeptal. Just an just answer to your point about hypercontractility, and I totally agree. And that is one of the parameters in our new uh, LAA classification. So it will appear there. You can score it in that classification as a risk factor. So we're running out of time, so we should move on. I mean, the rest, well, you, you, you can. Uh, sorry, this, I think this is excellent for a perspective registry. I am not sure that all in their own database uh, had all this uh, data. No, it's, but, but I think that, you know, at least if you have it, that you can fill it. I, I think that, you know, like the, the, the um, you know, variables that um, you, you don't have, you don't have just to put them. So we need I to put, it, as, as we said, excellent, It's right? an excellent base for a future uh, perspective registry. This is fantastic. Um, I think that the missing data probably are not in Jigglyball. And so, sorry. Also, I think it could be a good idea if it's not difficult to create a new user. You can create a new user for all of us that are interested in this. We can try and then send to you what we miss it, because otherwise it's going to be impossible to go through yeah. everything. Because, I mean, once you, met, you enter a patient, you realize what you want to, what data you have, what data you don't have, and how to. Like more Good. complex, um, yeah. So I think that we should um, finish. Uh, Javi, Javi, I think even more uh, to, uh, to follow up with what uh, Ignacio said, that uh, people go through it, test it, and maybe we can decide together what are the mandatory fields that we need. Sure. Like uh, our colleague said uh, just before, what are the ones that are really very super important in any kind of registry, and everything else is, is it's a bonus, you know? It's like, uh, me, for example, I like uh, all the 3D parameters, but it's very cumbersome to, uh, to fill. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, and sometimes you don't have it. And uh, so which one are really very, very important sure. as a basic registry, and then uh, upgrade? <laughs> So then you're doing the conclusions. Maybe Anders, you can show us, you know, the other two options. You know, they'll follow up very fast. I can uh, mm. race through them and then. Uh, oh. So we have for early and late follow-up imaging. They are the same. Uh, so uh, no need to go through uh, both of them. Uh, they have uh, a lot of the same parameters here, and uh, you can choose. Uh, had on CT here, period device leak. Um, let's just uh, move on. If it, uh, if it meant that you went on to do some uh, leak closures due to the period device leak here, you can enter that. We'll go to next form. That's the same one, just late follow-up. And then clinical events. And the clinical events works as a repeated instrument, which means that if you have more than one clinical event, you can re-enter in the same instrument. It just gets, uh, gets number one, number two, number three, number four. So here, you know, what I was missing, um, it's that it's death. I, I think that it yeah. should be here, like, I don't know, open <laughs> or not open, but something that to write down, you know, like why the patient died, no? Or why, if the patient had a stroke, what, what kind of a stroke? Or major bleeding, what kind of bleeding, no? Yeah. Uh, a possibility could be to enter a stroke uh, as a secondary clinical or stroke and then death maybe as a secondary clinical event on the same date, but I, I, I understand but I think that this is, is, this is easy. I mean, yeah. if, if you can add like um, as many, you know, like items as, as you need. You can, yeah. As long as you so can. we can enter this one and it will just, uh, just quickly and I, we will be off the stage and it will add a little plus here. So you can add another incident here and he, let's say he had an, a stroke on the same day. Um, 
if uh, we are running out of time and we want people to test it, I have made the demographics table as a where you can scan a QR code here, just a second. Um, and uh, I don't know if people are able to scan this and you can uh, then enter uh, at a later point, uh, try and go through the demographics table and uh, use that as a model for some feedback. And then uh, of course, if you have some feedback or, or things you want uh, for the other uh, instruments as well, we are, we are happy to hear what you have to say. Can we send that to the, all the participants? Yeah, we can do that as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. From the eight events? Yeah, let's, let's do that. For, for the follow-up, you also asked the drug regimen. We saw the imaging follow-up, but you also asked for the drug status, so the anti-thrombotic therapy at uh, follow-up. I'm Could pretty sure we do, but I'll have to double-check that. <laughs> But uh, I don't know if we need to move on. For the DRG, like there is like the option, no, yeah. no change, yeah, and yeah. And also, you know, for, for the medication, we need like um, discontinuation, yeah, and then the, yeah. if there is a change, yeah. that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense to brainstorm when all the comments are coming back one from your yeah. side. Did so. you measure how long it takes to fill one patient? No. <laughs> I think it's very important. Yeah, but it's a, an, important, uh, an important variable because to add. I yeah. must tell you from our experience, I tried to do a national mitral clip registry. And everything was very important. The systolic wave before and after, the pulmonic wave before and after. And it was very, very long, and no one filled it. Yeah. So it is important to choose so what are really important. Everything is interesting. I'm not sure that everything is very, but very I, I did, you know, because I, I was, you know, just playing a lot. And if you have the, the data and you have, like, the report of your transophageal echo or CT, it's fast. It's faster than it seems. Because you have all, all data and it's like, la, 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 and then the, the follow-up, it's very, it's very fast. And, and I'm not, you know, I'm really honest. It's maybe it takes 10 minutes uh, maximum, maybe five to 10 minutes. It's not, it's not complex at all, this, this um, database. Of course, if you start uh, and you need to, you know, perimeter or all this, of course. But if you have all the data there, I mean, it's, it's relatively fast. Yeah. So I, I don't know, like, Adele, you have that. Just one more show. I just want to show you, if I can find it here, this chart from the U.S. registry, uh, just to compare what uh, people really are filling in here in the U.S. Uh, let me see here. Uh. Uh, I mean, uh, convinced by this uh, database, and we want to participate. Uh, when you when you look at, uh, okay, good, me also. That's great. Okay, perfect. Uh, I, I think that we have to promote uh, the addition to this database in each country. Probably we have to think to a national coordinator to promote in his own country the addition to the database. So we could increase the number of, uh, of, of colleagues that are included in the database, included, or we insert the data in the database. And, and, and it's also true that um, Anders can tell that it's relatively easy if somebody wants just to add something yes. or <coughs> delete something. I mean, it's relatively easy to, to do it. So I mean, it's the same core for everybody, and then if you want to add something for any reason, so you can add it. So, so that's that's possible with Red Cap, and it's easy. Yeah, I think we have two central questions. Do everyone agree upon uh, initiation of this type of registry? That is question number one, and question number two is what should be the uh, specific design of the database? How many parameters should we include? And I will just present for you because I, I agree it can seem quite com complex to uh, enter all those data, but that's what's being done in U.S. This is this data collection form for the U.S. registry. So you can see again here you have uh, demographics, 
history, risk factors, chats, vask, has uh, stroke history, history of rhythm, uh, if there were which type of rhythm intervention that were done, uh, history of interventions, risk factors, epicardial <coughs> access, uh, diagnostic studies, and you can see this is really an exhaustive long document here, 18 pages. So it's really, really, really uh, demanding. Uh, and I don't think we should, of course, have this degree of details. But on the other hand, we also need to have data so we can, for instance, compare one device with another device. The degree of sealing, for instance, will be very important. And data on, on DRT, etc., will be extremely important. One third question will be, how can we actually get started with such a registry? Is it practical, possible in your country just to initiate such a registry? And how can we do it in the most uh, simple way? So I don't know if we can have the next presentation. I, I will say a little bit about that, yes. So one way uh, would be to... Uh, just, yeah, do a medical registry and get approval in your home countries uh, for a medical registry. And that is a very cumbersome uh, process and there's a lot of uh, uh, question about data transfer and, and everything and it might be uh, very, very time consuming. And another pathway which I believe will be the best and most easy pathway will uh, actually be to introduce such a registry as part of a research protocol. So we could do a European multi-center research study. Uh, it could be called, for instance, European ELAC uh, observational study. If you do such a type of uh, academic research protocol, you will all know uh, about the pathways for getting this approved and I believe it will also be more uh, attractive uh, for people to fund an uh, academic research project than just uh, uh, throwing money after a registry. So, I believe uh, that if we could do this very specific research uh, protocol talking about the scientific background, the rationale for doing this, uh, to define the sponsor and sponsor contacts, uh, etc. <coughs> With the primary objective of this uh, trial to be to investigate LAAC patient management and procedural outcomes in Europe. So have a very, very broad definition about the primary objective of such a study. And then you can define uh, secondary outcomes and you can, in principle, build in everything like indication for the procedure patient subpopulations, pre-planning, procedural aspects, post-procedural medication, follow-up, quality of life, cost-effectiveness. You, We should try to think about all what could be relevant to do with such a multi-center, large-scale European registry and build in uh, to a protocol. We can describe the registry design, uh, what are the participating sites, what will be the estimated number of patients, what will be milestone for such a project, what will be uh, rules for in and exclusion consent procedures? What will be about data analysis and management, quality control, ethical aspects, publication plan, and then also a registration into clinicaltrials.gov. So I would like to hear your uh, thoughts and feedback about this. Do you agree that this is suitable to make such kind of uh, overall research projects have a protocol for it and will that be easier? Will that be the easiest way in your countries to implement and start up a new registry? Any thoughts about that? 
<coughs> I think it's, uh, Sergio uh, is right in, uh, in uh, that uh, um, this uh, registry should be prospective for me. So it should be uh, not retrospective because uh, uh, I think it's uh, more important to um, investigate uh, what are we doing now. Therefore, it's uh, now and further uh, on. Therefore, it's, uh, it's my opinion. But don't you think that we have like now data from patients after 10 years? So if we can collect that would be also really I think um, nice. There will be an, I think an, exp an explosion not but an expansion of this procedure. Then uh, I think the number is not uh, a great problem for me. Number no, I, I, agree, I agree with you eh, that the perspective part it's the most important probably. But I think that you know for the ones that want just to add the patients retrospectively, we can get like really good studies as well and research. Yes, but many data would be mis missed, uh, and um, I don't know. It's a more uh, strong uh, st the study if, uh, is uh, the stronger the study if, uh, is uh, prospective. Yeah, but uh, Francesco, I think we we, we can do both. Uh, we can decide that we uh, collect the data retrospectively and we decide when the perspective registry will start. So we, uh, we have uh, both options. We don't miss the, the previous data, we the, so we have the follow up, and we will start with a new project, but uh, the data collection is exactly the same, the data set is the same. Yeah, I think uh, this, this design will allow us to do both. We can do uh, well-defined uh, studies based on retrospective data, and we can invite sites that want to yeah, uh, throw light on a specific uh, topic. Uh, they can enter retrospectively, and uh, I think, of course, I agree the main project should be prospective registration of data, but uh, we can still do also use this platform for retrospective data. And I think our research protocol should cover both options. Can I but Oh, sorry. Can I? In the meantime? I, th I think it's crucial if we really want to move forward and, and, and have some more output from all the data we're getting right now, because everybody is now using different database. We're also using REDCap. And the nice thing is you're in charge of your, your own data. And if we finally agree together which definitions and what fields we're going to, to fill. And I think it's filled in the same way. It's much easier to work together and, and, and collaborate because if we all keep working in our own red cap kind of database or Excel or whatever, it's a pity because now, now we have a lot of things going on. At the end, we always end up with these small studies. And now finally, we have something to really collaborate. And we know exactly everybody will use the same definition and it will use the same kind of field. So it will be much easier to share. I, uh, I'm in favor, I would say. Yeah, I was just wondering from a practical perspective, if, uh, if you want to include patients in a European registry through this uh, study uh, process, I am, I'm assuming they would also have to sign informed consent, which will be impossible for all the patients who are elderly and already died. So how do you see us fitting the retrospective data from all the dead patients uh, into uh, the registry? Well, I mean, it's like, I, I, I think that this is like, if I'm asking that I want just to review, you know, the patients that somebody have done during the last um, five years and you provide the data, it's, you have to deal with the same problem. I mean, um, let's review, you know, appendages, chicken wing appendages and sandwich. So you have to go back. It's exactly the same. So, and um, there are like centers that getting, you know, like the, the ethical approval for the retrospective analysis, it's very easy. Maybe. Some, you know, it's impossible, so then, you know, you cannot do that. But, but I think it is a, it's a very important point, and I don't want to be the party crasher here. Uh, I, I think registries are important, but we shouldn't uh, be too enthusiastic if you really want to know what's the impact of the anatomy. It has to be um, a, a properly defined trial with monitoring, etc. So uh, in our hospital group, we had registries, and at the end of the year, there was a comparison of the reimbursement department and what was actually put in by the physicians in the registry. And the amount of events that you miss in a registry is, is just, it's just incredible. So we all believe that if that we fill in the registry uh, correctly, and, uh, but we also know that from uh, randomized trials in the TAVR field, for example, stroke. 
if you don't have a, a neurologist assessing the patient, then whatever you're going to say about stroke, whether it happened or it didn't happen, is just useless. So all the registry data in the tower field have been in this regard kind of useless and only the, the prospective randomized controlled trials kind of filled the gap. So this is maybe a bit extreme what I'm saying, but uh, my impression is, to be very honest, I think it is a very enthusiastic project and it should be supported. But if we overload it with the amount of data that should be collected, don't expect good data quality. Every center will say, yeah, my data quality is good, but overall the data quality will be very poor. And then drawing conclusions out of these data is just, that's, that, that's just not science. Then, then you rely on, on, on bad data. And if you refer to the NCDR registry, I mean, I've, I've been uh, uh, proctoring a lot in the US. I mean, with every single procedure, there was like, huge staff of study nurses there filling in all these data. Mm. So it's, it's, I, I like the idea of doing it, but I think we really have to also ask ourselves what is coming out of such a registry? What data quality is, is, is coming out? And therefore I would advocate to keep it as simple just to keep data quality high. Mm. I agree I, with, with, with that statement yeah. because otherwise it's useless. And yeah. uh, for, the, for the question on the regulation, I mean, it's very clear. It has to be prospective, it has to be a consent, it has to be a clear protocol, it has to be very clear yeah. what are the responsibilities, there need to be contracts in place, otherwise it's just no longer timely and we need to be very, very uh, to this point. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, and what is, it, it's, for example, the name, you can forget to document the name as you shown in the American registry. It's forbidden to provide names on a server that is somewhere in Denmark. It's completely impossible. No, you have to create a pseudonym uh, so that you are able uh, to, or allowed by the ethical committee to transfer data to a server uh, uh, in a, on a foreign country. So it's, it's much more complex mm. than we believe and we need to look at this very much in detail and I fully agree we have to keep the li limits and we need to make clear, you know, this uh, ma data is mandatory and all the rest is for those who like it but not, not, not really mm. mandatory because yeah. otherwise it will be unusable. Yeah, I totally agree with your comments, Fabian, but uh, you also have to realize that randomized clinical trials, it's also very selective patients and it doesn't answer all your questions. You need registries to, to keep what's going on in, in real life and uh, I mean we have all an obligation to follow up what are we doing, especially with new interventions. and. If we make it very complex, yes, we will probably get poor uh, data collection. If we make it uh, very simple and intuitive, uh, we can heighten the, the quality. And uh, things like adjudication, we also have to consider if we should build in some type of adjudication. I mean, uh, let's let us uh, monitor some of the participating centers for their data quality. I mean, if people dedicate uh, themselves to participate in a registry like this, they also should dedicate themselves to enter in a, in a high quality way and, and complete data. Otherwise, it, it doesn't make sense. Then you will get what you are alluding to, low quality data that will not bring the, the field uh, forward. But uh, has to be neurological outcome. So how are you going to assess the patient during follow-up? You know, maybe in, in, in Denmark, uh, it's a totally different situation how you do the follow-up of patients than it is in Switzerland or it is in Portugal or wherever. Yeah. So at the end, you have data where in one country, the study nurse is calling the patient in another country. Uh, the study nurse is just reviewing hospital charts. And, and, and I mean, neurological outcome is the key outcome of, yeah. this, of this registry. And I think the main question is, how will you get good data on neurological yeah. outcome? And it is yeah. impossible to good, get good data without sending the patient to your neurologist. Yeah.
if you call the patient, even as a cardiologist, or if I call the patient, it's not you, it's not, nothing against you, but if I call the patient, it, I mean, the outcome of what you get out of the patient is just not the same. Yeah, but th this weakness is part of many, many registry published in big journals, and yes. I think even in the NCDR registry, uh, with a lot of publications, as uh, Jens Eric has shown, I'm not sure that there is like a... That doesn't make it better. You know, if everybody is doing it wrong, it doesn't justify no. if we do it wrong. No, 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 I agree, I agree. But I mean, I mean, you, you, must, you must, I mean, stroke is probably a very important outcome, but the safety of the procedure, the, the demographics, the, the, there's a lot of other information that you get from a large registry. It's not only uh, the stroke input. It's, it's a very important one, but there are many others. I, th I think everything that has been said is true and important, of course but we have to adjust maybe the questions. For example, if you do a retrospective registry, we will have a, a lot of data from many centers within a very short time. And if we talk about that there are so many unresolved questions, we can answer those questions, or at least we can, uh, we can hypothesize a little bit better and then put this into perspective to answer those questions prospectively. So I would advise to do uh, 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 somehow focused retrospective analysis to focused on the most burning questions and then based on the results design the prospective uh, database. Uh, so it's, uh, everything is, is important of course and the, the ultimate goal is to look for neurological outcomes which should be resolved with uh, randomized data. Just to have to register. remind ourselves that you need the consent from the patient to share data within the Europe, this European registry. Otherwise, at least in Switzerland, we are not allowed to uh, share any data in, for a European uh, initiative because we did not ask consent for that. In Spain, we are allowed. Just to uh, it's yes, but it's, it's one problem that we have for, with the ethical committee. The, one, probably one of the first questions of the ethical committee will be who is the owner of the data? Or oh, where, where is the repository? Because if for the for the for the registry, there are not ethical problem. The only ethical problem is the management of the data, and we have to declare. But I think it's not a problem. But we have to to to, to define the the modality of uh, uh, data collection and the, the 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 management of the repository. So I, I think that is. I, I, in Italy, uh, probably the, 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 this uh, will be the only main question that we have to address, and probably in Europe because the, the last rules that are um, from three years ago are equivalent in more or less in all Europe. So I suppose that the, the problem is for all the UA, UA countries. I think that maybe we should uh, consider start a prospective pilot study to see what we can get and not go back and try and look if we have this data and retrospectively. And this prospective study should be including also consent of the patient, of course, because we are looking for... Looking it's probably different for retrospective and the perspective, but for the perspective, of course, I suppose that we have to address this point clearly. And probably it should be included in the consensus uh, for the patient. Okay, are you uh, available to share your data, et cetera, et cetera? But uh, I agree that at this point it's much easier to begin with a prospective registry. And otherwise, if we decide that we can run some studies based on the proposal, we can participate as we have done so far, just retrospective, but not with this database. So, I mean, both mm -hmm. things can be together. Be because I totally agree that one of the limits that we have is regulation. So it will be much easier to agree with variables are going to be included, make it perspective, and you have consent of all the patients. And otherwise, if we, we want, we can do retrospective studies as we have done so far. Even using the same database, but I mean, but this as a registry, new registry, ethical committee, all this stuff should be prospective, although we can do the other thing with the same database. Ethical committee, uh, the last release of, in Europe is that the, the first ethical committee that approved the, the, the registry, uh, the approval is valid for all the countries in all Europe. But uh, the, uh, in Europe, the, 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 um, is the, the, the last uh, 
um, release of the rules is of three years ago, two years ago. I, I have to check, but I'm sure that the main problem is that, uh, because probably we could imagine um, several national registries that uh, are part of a, a, an European registry. Uh, we have to check what is the, the best solution, the mm. formal solution uh, with, the, with the ethical committees. We could okay. use the voting system for the question of retrospective, prospective, no? Use, sorry. Uh, we could use the voting system. Yeah. Or not? Yeah. We, we yeah. To get an impression. Who, yeah, who yeah, prefer yeah. a prospective? Who wants to do a prospective one? I mean, a registry. Yeah, yeah? I think my immediate Prospective. Yeah. Prospective. prospective. <coughs> yeah, the consensus is for prospective. What are the options? It's prospective, 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 and retrospective. Yeah. I mean, mainly prospective, I think. Yeah. People want to. Uh, everybody wants mainly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But also but I think that a good option could be to collect retrospectively all. It, all data is possible to have, and then we start with the perspective. I think this could be a good option, but we have, we have to, to, to vote, I, we yeah. decide what to do. We should not go for, a, I mean, total rate, retrospective uh, registry. That would be enormous. So if we are going to enter data retrospectively, it should be in a focused, well-defined project. That's, that's my opinion. And, uh, Adel, if, will you try to, uh, to sum conclude, up and uh, make a conclusion? I, I, I will try to sum up. Yeah. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the audience because a uh, very, very uh, nice input uh, and uh, it's, that, that's exactly what we wanted actually uh, from your side, so it's, it's very nice. Can I have my slide, please? So we have said very, very interesting things uh, about uh, the registry, so I would just yeah, we just shown this slide. So, so I think that if we create this large registry, there are many, many advantages. Uh, of course, we need to define how to do it in the right way with ethical committees, and this has been said here. I think, uh, Martin, you have said already that uh, we need to standardize the data collection across different European countries. We all have our own registries, our own data set, and every patient that uh, when we lose some information, it's a patient lost. I mean, we can gather a lot of very interesting information. So also the fact that we have a common registry ensures that, that we can compare and have consistency in the data, which is very essential for a, a good analysis. I think beyond the outcome, it's also a, a large European registry will also help us to understand what are the variations in practice across Europe, because there's many ways to perform LA closure in Germany, in, in the Nordic countries, in France, in Belgium, and things like that. So the, so the goal is to identify this variation. This is beyond, I mean, the stroke rate and so on. I mean, just to understand, and many, many, I mean, many important uh, pub publications have been done from the NCDR just on the practice, actually. Who is using ICE, who is using uh, uh, Mini-T, who is using uh, different things, and is it safe or not? That, that's very important things that we can uh, extract from a registry. Of course, we want to fill gaps in clinical evidence regarding uh, uh, some uh, rare outcomes like DRT and PDL. And as Gentryk said, also, we, it's, a, it's a good tool to uh, improve the post-market surveillance. Every time you, you, you introduce something new, like a new imaging technique, like a new uh, uh, procedural guidance, everything, we can use the registry to assess the safety and efficacy of uh, this new uh, um, innovation, these innovations within the technique. Uh, definitely, uh, we have to start uh, simple, like a registry, and, but if, we build up a nice registry, it will, it will take time, if, especially if it's prospective. When Philippe has shown the Ocean Tavi registry, it has taken five, six years to start to get the first publication, and now it's like a usual business, they have a lot of data, the, the registry is running in a very nice way. So we must be patient because it will take time, but I imagine here how many, if we do it prospectively, how many cases we, we can collect within one year. Of course, if we, if we have a good uh, platform, easy to implement and so on, but we can have very easily within one year, we can have more than 1,000 procedures with good, uh, with good data and so on. And so that's going to be very, imp uh, very interesting. Um, and also many things, we can uh, assess the economic impact in different countries. And also I think, and that's why Xavi was extremely exhaustive, but it's uh, also an opportunity to implement novel data types. 
For example, I don't know any kind of registry in the US when they have, uh, for example, they have the 3D data set, uh, they have, for example, the mechanism of the leak and things like that. So, okay, it takes some time, but that will make the originality of the, of the database. If you can have on 300 patients, uh, it's, it's, you can put it in the database, but you have 300 patients when you know exactly what is the mechanism of leak and how you can link this mechanism, for example, to a worse outcome or not, that will be a big difference between uh, 3, 000, uh, 300 patients and uh, uh, 100,000 uh, patients in the NCDR registry when actually you cannot extract this data. So uh, the, the, the novel data types, I think it's very important. Of course, it must not be like a super uh, impossible to complete, but I think it's important to, to consider new data uh, uh, in this registry. So that's what I wanted to say as a conclusion, and uh, I hope really that uh, you will join this uh, this initiative, and uh, and uh, I really uh, very I'm very enthusiastic about this. Oh, thank you. Thank you.